Hello, this is Mrs. Johnson. This is MAT 221 Calculus 1. This is the beginning of Unit 2, where we start talking about limits and the concept of the derivative. Section 2.1 talks about both the tangent line to the curve and the tangent, what a tangent line is, and works with velocity problems. So remember from geometry class that the tangent uh, to a circle is actually a line that is drawn to the outside of the circle so that the line just kisses the, t the circumference of the circle. That was that concept of what a tangent line was to a circle. However, that idea of a tangent line to a curve is a little bit more complicated. So let's look at this figure that we have in front of us. The line L, the blue line, intersects the graph of the function C only once. So it's only intersecting the curve once, but is certainly not what we think of as a tangent line. Yet line T, on the other hand, looks like a tangent line to the curve because it's just kissing the curve at this point P, but it intersects the curve at another point, this curve C at another point. So a tangent line to a curve at a point actually can pass through the point at another uh, point somewhere on the curve. So the tangent line to the curve we say has a point of tangency where in this case P is the point of tangency where line T is tangent to curve C at point P. Line L is simply a line that intersects the curve at that point of tangency. However, T is what we think of in calculus as a tangent line to the curve. It is a line that hits the curve at one distinct point called the point of tangency and just kisses the curve at that point. It may, however, hit the, point, hit the curve somewhere else or multiple times somewhere else on the curve. Also recall from back in seventh grade, actually, we did motion problems. Remember, distance equals rate times time, or distance equals speed times time, or speed equals distance divided by time. These were all things that we studied um, earlier in our math career. So let's talk about the difference between speed versus velocity. Those of you guys that took physics may know this already, but those of you who have never studied physics, this might be something new. The concept of velocity is considered a vector in which the direction that the object is moving is also considered as well as the speed or how fast or the magnitude of the velocity. Therefore, speed tells us how fast something is moving or changing, and velocity also tells us the direction of the movement. So a positive velocity may move in whatever a positive direction is considered in the problem, or a negative velocity may consider um, a downward or a whatever negative uh, velocity is considered depending on the problem we're talking about. So let's consider the speed or the velocity of an object, let's say a grapefruit. Many years ago, I took one of my calculus classes outside to the parking lot, and I had one of my baseball players actually throw a um, grapefruit up into the air and um, I had one of my other students track it with a gun that we use. It's a tracking gun that tracks um, the height in feet um, from the physics department and we got the data that you see above from one to six seconds where um, t is in seconds and y is in feet above the ground. So the height of, of the grapefruit looks something like this where it started at six feet down here. By the way, this young man was about six feet, or he was actually a little bit smaller than six feet, but his arm reached to six foot. And then you can see that the grapefruit went up to its peak and then came back down again. Now, notice I don't have any um, actual scale on this x and y axis, or in this t and h or f of t, uh, y axis here, but I know that the grapefruit went up came to a peak and then came down due to lots of different factors. And this was approximately the data. We just rounded to the nearest 
uh, foot. We could see that the grapefruit fruit left the thrower's hand at a high speed. We know that because from one sec zero seconds to one second, it went from six feet above the ground to 90 feet of ground in one second. So it went up 84 feet in that first second. And then it went from 90 to 142 feet, which if you can see there would be 52 feet, it went in this second. So in the very beginning, it went pretty fast. And then it starts to slow down as it comes down in the other direction. So it reaches its maximum height and then it speeds up in the downward direction until it's literally, it did splat, it hit the ground. So how do we find its average velocity over any given time, uh, time interval or time period? This also comes back from our studies of rates of change in many of our earlier math courses that we took in our math career. Remember, um, the rate of change or the average velocity is the change in the position of an object over the change in time, or the average rate of change is the change in the output over the change in the input, which often we call the slope of the curve or the slope. So the average rate of change of a quantity over a period of time is the amount of change divided by the time it takes to make the change. In general, the average rate of change of a function over an interval is the amount of change divided by the length of my given interval, say average speed, growth of populations, average rainfall. So if I wanted to find the average rate of change of a given function, if I had the actual function on a given interval, notice this is interval notation from an interval when x equals 0 to x equals 1 over this um, function, I would take the change in my outputs, which are, I would find the output at 0 and the output at 1, which is simply by putting them in there. Then I would take the slope, or change in output over change in input, change in my y values over change in my x values. When I put that in, I would get 4, and I don't have any units here, so I would say my average rate of change on the interval from 0 to 1 is 4 units per whatever my um, out input units were. So average rate of change is simply the slope between two distinct points in time. So going back to our grapefruit and looking at our grapefruit, how would I compute the average velocity of the grapefruit on the interval from four seconds to five seconds? Well, what I would do is I would find my average velocity is simply output at five minus output at four divided by five minus four, change in my output, over change in my input. That's my average rate of change, my average velocity in this case. I do have units here, and I get 106 minus 150 over one, which is negative 44. And my units are always fractional when I talk about a rate of change. My output units are feet, so that's 44 feet. My input units are seconds, so that would be seconds. So my answer here would be my average velocity of the grapefruit from four to five seconds would be negative 44 feet per second. So what's the significance of the sign of our answer? The significance of the sign tells us the direction because remember velocity has a direction. It's telling me I'm going in the downward direction. In other words, on this part of the curve. So we can tell that we're going downward from 150 feet to 106 feet in that one second. If s of t is the position of an object in a time, then the average velocity of an object over a time interval from a to b is given as the change in position over change in time. Or, again, this is um, function notation, change in my output over change in my input. In words, the average velocity of an object over an interval is the net change in my position during the interval divided by the time in that change, by the change in that time. So we can always think of average rate of change as simply the slope of a secant line through two distinct points. We may also want to know how fast the graph is changing at one point. And in order to do that, what we do is we take two points and we bring the two points closer and closer and closer together until we get to the tangent line at one point. Now remember, there's a significant difference between a slope of a secant line, which is two distinct points on the curve, and the slope of a tangent line, 
which is the slope of the line that is supposed to just kiss the curve at one point. So how can I find the slope or the average rate of change if the point is only one point? There's a problem here. However, Newton and Leibniz, the two fathers of calculus, came up with an idea of what they were going to do here to calculate this instantaneous rate of change, or the rate of change, or the slope of a tangent line to a curve at one point. Now I'm going to play this again so you can see what happened here. Q and P are my two points. I can distinctly find the slope easily between those two points by drawing the secant line between the two points. But if I wanted to know the, the tangent line at P, what I would do is I would bring Q closer, and then closer, and then as close as I can to P so that the two points are almost on top of each other. So we have P and Q are two points along the curve and a distinct line between those two points, PQ, is called the secant line. And it will approach the tangent line at one point as long as Q is as close as we can make it to P. In other words, the slope of the tangent line is going to be called the instantaneous rate of change of the graph at a given point. Again, that point is called the point of tangency. Now, the problem is, my dilemma is, I can't actually find the slope if I only have one point. I have to use two points. But we're talking about one point here. So, a French mathematician, a little bit before Leibniz and Newton started working on this concept, Pierre Fermat found a solution back in 1629 that we still use today. He said, start with what we can calculate, the slope of the secant line, through two points P and Q that are close to each other, and then find the limit of the secant line, if it exists, as X approaches P along the curve. In other words, take the limit of the slope as the two points get closer and closer and closer together so that the denominator of the slope equation almost becomes zero but never gets to zero. So we take the limit, that targeting value of what that value is going to be as Q and P get closer and closer together. This will be the slope of the curve at P or the tangent to the curve at P. It is the line through um, that point P with that slope. So in other words, we're pulling the two points so we can still feel a, find a slope so that the distance between them, the limit or the distance between them, comes closer and closer and closer to zero, but never reaches zero. Again, that concept of limit, of targeting a value, but never having to reach a value. So here's an illustration of that limiting process that Pierre Fermat did. If I want to know the tangent line to the curve at, um, at the point P here, what Fermat did is he took two points P and Q and he found that blue slope. Then he brought Q closer to P and then he found that blue slope. And then he brought Q closer to P and he found that Q slope. And he kept on doing that, getting closer and closer so that the blue line and the red line almost looked like it was identical to each other. Notice this is when Q is approaching P from the right. Just like we did with limits, we're going to do a left-handed and right-handed approach here. This is what it looks like if we take and start at our point at, at point P, and we take P and Q, and we bring, we find the slope of the curve between P and Q. Then we bring Q closer to P and find the slope, then we bring Q closer to P and find the slope, and we bring it as close as we can to P with not actually sitting on top of P, but the two lines, the blue line and the red line, would almost sit on top of each other. This is the concept that Pierre Fermat came up with that Newton and Leibniz actually stole from him to come up with the process of that limiting value of the difference quotient, which is called the derivative of the curve or the instantaneous rate of change of the curve.